Welcome to a very special episode of The Dart Show with a genuine legend of the game, a world champion in both codes of darts, the BDO and the PDC, founding member of the WDC as well, and one of the most enduringly popular figures in the game. It is Dennis the Menace Priestley. That do you for an intro? Oh, thank you. That's a nice introduction. Well, you've earned every single word of it, Dennis. Yes, I wrote that down and you've got it talk too. <laughs> um, Dennis, look, it's a pleasure to have you here talking to us today. Uh, we want to cover everything, basically. And darts, obviously, a huge, huge thing in your life, but didn't really become a big thing in your life until quite later in life, did it? No, um, not until I was in my very late uh, 30s, actually. I started playing uh, for Yorkshire in, in the early 80s when I was probably 33 or something like that. Mm. And then I was... Uh, th- three or four years before I got selected to play for England. And you've got to be a lot better than Southern players to even be considered with when you've played up north. Honestly, it's, really? it's not, yeah, it's, it's a fact. Uh, the the year before I expected uh, to really get to chosen to play for England, I, I, I got overlooked. I, the year after I didn't do quite so, quite so well and I got picked. <laughs> so uh, I never worked that one out. Well, let, let's talk about everything that, that led up your life before darts, because it's, you know, a proper Yorkshire grafting life, wasn't oh, yeah. it? I mean, what, what, was, what was growing up like? I mean, it's, we're here in Barnsley at the minute. You're from Mexborough. You've never, never left that area. You've always lived there, haven't that's, you? That's right, yeah. So what was life like for you growing up? Well, I never, I never uh, wanted for anything, I don't think. When I was a kid, I can't remember... F- being hungry or anything like that. Uh, my dad was always a, a grafter. Um, uh, after the, he was in the Second World War as a mechanic, uh, came out expecting a job as a, a mechanic, and the people who owned the garages and that wanted to pay him less money because they'd been at forces and they'd risked their life in the Second World War. And it, I think that upset my father. Um, and he, he went down, uh, worked down the pit. Um, it was working down Manvers on nights. And then during the day, he was uh, setting business up. So you, you went into the sort of coal industry as well. Did you go down the pit yourself, or were you just No, I never, I've never been down a pit. I, uh, I always said I, I should have uh, visited one to see you know, what the conditions was actually like. Mm. No, uh, I was a coal merchant, mm. um, you know, taking it out in the eight stone bags. How are you doing that? I mean, is that like, do you have a little van for it? Or? No, um, I had a, a transit pickup, yeah, the twin wheel, carried 35 bags, and then I uh, I built up to a, a bigger a Bedford, what, what carried five ton, so that were 100 bags. So you'd set up you you a business, you were doing all right? Yeah, good to see me and uh, my dad, really. Um, mm. It was... Uh, well, at one time, uh, you'll pr- if you're not from the north, you'll not, not ne- probably never seen it, but when you worked at the pit, you was allowed so many tonnes of coal. Right. And they used to, it used to be t- uh, delivered uh, loose. Now, they got nine or ten uh, loads per year, and a lot of people couldn't burn that much, so they'd give it away to the, the, the son or daughter or, or, or whatever, and they used to ring us up. Uh, will you pick this call up from Maple Road, next for number so and so? Take it to my sons in uh, in Denneby or or wherever, and we'd we'd charge a, a bit of haulage fee. So so we was actually breaking the law, I would imagine. But, <laughs> but my me and my oldest brother, we had big ten uh, size ten shovels, and uh, we could clear a ton of ton of coal onto it back at wagon in less than five minutes. <laughs> And we're away. Before, before anybody made a yeah. phone call, as if we were stealing it, we used to we used to you know, put it on a lot of that fast. We wasn't stealing it, obviously. Amazing! Look, when you were doing that, and what that went into your into your thirties, and well, like... before that, um, I mean, I left school when I was fifteen. I had uh, my dad got me a job with a with a builder, and uh, I lasted two weeks. I was supposed to be apprentice bricklayer. I never saw a brick or a trowel. All I saw was a sweeping bush and uh, cups of tea. With, with that, you weren't interested in making tea and sweeping. No, up, I, I thought I'd be straight on trowel at fifteen. Bit of a cocky, cocky so and so, but um, 
Anyway, uh, one of the friends, they were going for an interview at Parkgate Iron and Steel, and I tagged along. And uh, they said, do you want to have an interview as well? So I actually started working at Parkgate Iron and Steel when I was 15. Was that a foundry or was that... That a... still works, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's in between where I live and, and Rotherham. It was a five-mile journey. So what was it that, you know, you a succession of jobs in sort of pretty hard manual graft... When did darts suddenly appear? How did that well, factor into your life? I um, I always went in a, a local local pub uh, called Miner's Arms, and on a Monday they used to play what they call panel games, and we we still actually do. I played yesterday actually, and it's darts, dominoes, and crib. Well, my granddad learnt me how to play crib when I was ten and eleven years old, so that was I played crib and dominoes, and it was short for a, a player at darts in team. And said, "Come on, Dennis, have, uh, make us up." But it was on the double board at, at seven foot. The Yorkshire foot. board. Yeah, Yorkshire yeah. board. So yeah. no trebles, double, no just trebles, doubles. doubles only, and it was seven foot mark. And uh, I, I, without practicing, I was probably they said I was as good as some of what were already in team. You know what I mean? So I thought, all right, I'll I'll play darts every week if they pick me. So that's that's how it happened. So did you just? I mean, you you're in your thirties at this point. When, uh, when you first pick up a dart, yeah. you? did you just go? Oh, I actually quite enjoy this, or was it that you were good? No, that you I wasn't it? good. No, um, it was. I was in my late twenties actually um, when when I uh, started playing. Um, I bought a I bought a set of tungsten darts, Willie, Willie Etherington, twenty six gram. Um, I could say I had a bet on on Grundy in Derby, <laughs> and Grundy won it. Won the Derby. In, 75 or 76 and that's i spent 11 pound 20 on a, a set of tungsten darts it's pricey by then then yeah 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 it was virtually a week's well half a week's work so did you did you get the bug then once you started playing yeah i started playing uh, on like i said on a monday and uh double board uh, i got the league to change to a treble board in a, a few years later which uh which occurred after after it being on tv the world championship in 78 when john John Law lost to um, uh, Leighton Reese, mm -hmm. and they they played off seven foot six. Well, so we moved back six inch, which which doesn't seem a deal, but when you've been used to throwing closer, that six inch is is massive. You know, you'd be going for treble, and it'd be dropping at bull height till you got used to it. We got used to that seven foot six mark, and then they put it to seven foot nine, and we to <laughs> we to go again. And then if you wanted to play in News at World, it were eight foot, so you got to go again, you know. So um, anyway, I, I played on that uh, panel games on a Monday, and then somebody asked me to play on a Tuesday, and then somebody asked me to play in a league on a Wednesday. So I, I was virtually playing in a league every day at week. And could you, were you getting a bit of reputation as yeah. know, one of the best players around yeah, it, not I, the best? Yeah, I was getting a, a bit of a res, uh, reputation because... Uh, in them days, in early early eighties, uh, late very late seventies, a lot of pubs and clubs put hundred pound uh, games on. You know, you'd you'd probably be drawn out one one Sunday afternoon. You play, and then they say, "Oh, you play maybe next Sunday or a week or Sunday," and until it got to the final. And I was winning a, f a few few of those, you know, hundred pound a time. Sharing with a friend of mine, uh, Mick Critchlow, and uh, only time he ever won anything, and we shared. He won a tea's made. <laughs> no, I thought that was just my luck. I'm I'm dishing fifty quid out to him, quite regular, and he gets a tea's made. You can't split the tea's made down the middle. Not really, can you? Can you? Well, did you let him keep it? Yeah, you did. Okay, fair enough. Um, what was it? You mentioned like seeing the darts on the telly when the World Championship was on, and then Leighton Reese and John Lowe in the final. That darts appearing on the telly, that must have been quite a big deal at the time. That, and was, then, a, that was a spur, yes, yeah. to, to play. What I mean, I hesitate to use the phrase darts crazy, but that's the <laughs> sort of boom going into the 80s where people really start taking notice of this game and you're, you're really starting to get properly involved in it. You're playing a lot of nights a week. What was that like? Were people sort of giving the sport a bit more attention a bit more credence yes it did um obviously the still was able to smoke and drink on stage um but it, with it being on television 
it was a big spur for, for the game. The treble boards as well, so people in our area look to play on the treble board more than the Yorkshire board. And uh, that, yeah, that was a spur. I mean, to be fair, I was old enough in 78 to be to been, uh, been playing top level darts, but I seemed to have a very slow progression of uh, being good enough to play in a team, a pub team, and then being good enough to play in the Super League, what got you to pick to play for Yorkshire, and uh, so on and so on. It was just a gradual climb for me, whereas I could have been involved if I'd have been good enough or took it serious enough uh, when the boom was on. <clears throat> that that boom is happening, and while you're there playing, and you say, "Well, I wasn't good enough at the time." Did you ambitions to be good enough? Did you think no. you didn't just didn't no, think it was I'd, possible? I had, had a, my own business. As, you know, I was a coal merchant. Um, I had three young children at that stage. In '79, uh, Wayne was born. Adam wasn't born f- another seven years after in '86. Um, so no, I, I got to think of uh, feeding the family first before. You know, taking that seriously. So, what changed then? What What was the the catalyst for you to go? You know, I, I think this could be something I could devote it, more it time changed, to. It changed after I got picked for Yorkshire and got settled it, playing for Yorkshire and got got playing in the A team quite regular, and um, and I could see that uh, the 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 British rankings, if you was in the top eight, even if you didn't win a tournament. You was on something like eight, or I think it was eight or twelve grand, certain money. So that that's what my aim was then uh, to to get into the top eight. And so I travelled abroad. I went to Sweden and uh, Switzerland and Canada and, and got points. That's a big deal, then, isn't it? Yeah, it was all expense. I mean, no sponsor or anything. I mean, that's that's a big decision to take in itself, particularly going somewhere like Canada at mm. the time, um, yeah. because that's. Yeah, you know, it wasn't something that a lot of people did regularly. Yeah, Sweden could, wouldn't have been a, a destination for most people in the UK back then. Well, if you wanted to drink, it was a, 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 big, a big expense. <laughs> I, think, I think it were a five or a bottle in, in early, early mid eighties. That ain't extra prices. No, not <laughs> even now. <laughs> but that's that's a big decision to start going around the world because you say you've got the. A family and yes. a job. Like, how did, did that cause any tension, or was it? Was no, it- I'd, I'd, I'd always the full backing of uh, my wife, which uh, any any top sportsman will tell you. If you if you have not got the backing of, of uh, you know your partner, then you you know you you're batting uphill all the time. <laughs> Whereas uh, I was winning a few checks, and uh, it, it was it was helping better as as life. Um. Yeah, the Canadian one. I think I got to the last eight when I went to, to Toronto. That got me a couple of points. I got a couple of points in Switzerland. I must have got points somewhere else. And I'd got 22 points um, when I got when I got into uh, into the embassy. Now, getting to the World Championship and getting to play on the telly, that, that's a big yeah. old deal. Yes, it was. Um, I, uh, the September prior, prior to playing in uh, January 91 when I won it, uh, I did lose in the final to uh, to Phil Taylor in uh, in one what was a t- holiday camp down south. It was uh, the top eight ranked uh, English players and the top eight in the averages of uh, York, not Yorkshire but all the counties. Yeah. Anyway, I, I, in fact, Steve Beaton. Uh, I, I played Steve Beaton. I'm not sure if it was f- first game or second game. And I played Bob Anderson and beat Bob, and I lost to Phil two sets to one in the final. It's when uh, when there was two lots of um, uh, not terrestrial TV, Sky. Mm-hmm. There was, there's what they call the square dish, the square yeah. dish B B Sky B, and then there was Sky itself, and it was on that square dish that B Sky B. So I'd lost in the September then, and then I got selected. I got selected to play for uh, in the embassy. But prior to, prior to that, the December before the embassy, I played in the Winmal World Masters, and um, I've made. I, I, I'm not quite sure if I made last eight or or semi-finals, but uh, I did. Uh, I did have a bet on myself uh, to win embassy because there was Ladbrokes betting yeah. there, 
And uh, I was on offer at 50 to 1, so I thought I'll have 20 quid on this. So I put 20 quid on myself. All my friends smarter than me, they back with corals and they, was, they were giving 80 to 1. <laughs> so in just one bet, I lost 600 quid. <laughs> But uh, that's that's a Yorkshireman for you. Well, you say that, but you you went on and did it. You went on and, and won the embassy. Now, becoming world champion, I mean, w- what an experience. What was it like? Because, yes, all right, you've been playing darts for a few years, but this is a totally different category yeah, of fish, isn't it? Was it? A, uh, I looked at the situation and, uh, I mean, obviously, Phil Taylor was defending and he'd beat me uh, a couple of times previously. Um, and I looked at the situation and I played him in the quarterfinals as long as I won my first two games. And my first one was against Magnus Callis, who had been in the embassy the year before. Mm-hmm. And he uh, qualified because at that time, if he made the last eight, he was automatically invited back. Mm-hmm. So that was my goal to make the last, to, to, to play, uh, get to play Phil Taylor at least. And I knew I'd have another shot in, in 92 then. But uh, I beat Magnus three sets to nil without dropping a leg. And then Bob Eve, the Canadian, who had uh, been a, a good campaigner, did did well in the embassy. I beat him three sets to nil. I don't think I dropped a leg there either. So, I mean, obviously I was on a high. I'd, and then I, I'd, you know, I come against uh, Phil Taylor. And I was three sets to one down. I think he had the odd dart occasionally to, to take me out. But I fought back and then won uh, one, four, three. What was that feeling like? I mean, did you feel that that this is my title to win? Then I've taken oh, yeah. that title. As, as soon as as soon as I got by uh, Phil Taylor, I thought, well, there's not, you know, what was going to stop me? Do you and remember? That's what I thought. Do you remember what it felt like to hit the winning dart in the final? I do. I know. I, I can tell you exactly what was going through my head. Um, I, I was on. Uh, I was on four hundred, and um, and I'm thinking, and and I'm I'm, I'm in command and. I'm thinking I want to finish this without going, you know, around the houses, missing a double and had chances. And, and I took 101 out, uh, treble 20, single nine, 32, to win the title, 101. That's, I mean, it, that's the pinnacle, being a world champion. That's, you know, the, the guy who started, only started playing in his late 20s and only really started playing properly in his late 30s. Yeah. Like... That's quite a rise you've had to the very, very top. What you know? What does that bring you? What's the, what's the feeling then? Well, obviously a great feeling uh, to be world champion. I mean, we went to, we went off. Uh, they had a break after five five sets, and uh, Eric had not played that well. But when after the break, we was uh, in the back room and I was just practicing and had a, a little sip of alcohol. No, I, I didn't drink much uh, to be to be fair, and uh, I'm thinking, right, this is like going on now for a county game. It's five legs, I've, you know. I want to win this this set. And I think Eric came in with a, a eleven or twelve data uh, in one of the because yeah, I think I won that last set three sets to one, and I thought, oh hello, the big fight back could could be coming, but uh, luckily for me, I snuffed it out. What was it like? going up against Eric back in those days? Because everybody knows Eric was a character. He was oh, brash but, and he was bold and he was mouthy and he wasn't shy about telling people that he was going to beat them, but... They were like, it, to be that, all that bluster was like, uh, like Walsh well, off a duck's back, to be honest. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't really bother me. I'd, I'd played Eric a couple of times and beat him prior. I beat him in the final at Los Angeles opening in 89. I had no fears, to be, to be fair. You know, uh, Did you feel like whatever mind games he was trying were completely yeah. pointless? I, I was I was on the ball uh, when it you know on that particular week. I was in. I mean, it was a it was a topsy turvy week to be quite honest. Um, we we bought into a, a news agent, but uh, we arranged to buy this in the August of 1990. And the, I was with the stock taker after my first game. I drove back home. I was uh, with the stock taker for hours on a Saturday uh, buying this paper shop. So then next Sunday morning, I drove back down to play, play my second game. Dennis, that seems a very strange thing to do in the middle of the biggest tournament of your life. And well, right before I'd the no, final. I had no option. You know. 
<laughs> yeah, the stock, you know, the firm sent the stock taker on, on the Saturday and somebody had got to be there with him. So I drove back home after my game uh, with the stock taker until more or less midnight on the, on the Saturday. I drove back down on Sunday. I must have played on the Monday then against Magnus Caris after winning my first first game. Anyway, uh, I mean, I mean, if we, in hindsight, if if we know I was going to win, we would never have bought the <laughs> bought the uh, news agent because, you know, I got set on doing exhibitions with uh, with uh, breweries and etc. And I, I was probably getting back home at half one, two o'clock, half past two, and wife were up at half past three, opening news agent. So if we hadn't, we got shut of it within six months. <laughs> <laughs> if, if not, it would have probably killed her. Well, the thing is, becoming world champion, that's big money. And all the knock-on effects, as you say, the exhibitions and the, there's big sponsors around and all sorts of stuff. That that That's life-changing, isn't it? That sets you up for the next few years. And there's a career there. And this is, this is I've made this work. That must yeah. be... That is genuinely changing your life from Dennis Priestley, oh, the coal merge. Definitely, yeah. I mean, it came at the right time. As you said, I was late when I was still 40, 40 and a half. Um, yeah, big change. I mean, obviously, uh, getting older, your body not not wanting to lift sacks of coal when, it, when the wet throw and it's winter and the snow on the ground and diesel's freezing in cab, in, to, in lorry and you're having to clean the jets out and no, uh, I, I didn't miss uh, winter being a coal man, that is a certainty. I bet. Um, let's talk about a guy you've already mentioned a few times, Phil Taylor. Uh, the the man is synonymous with the sport. But there was a good long period where you and him were knocking lumps out of each other on the board and basically sharing the prize money all the way yeah. through. It was a nice little arrangement. You yeah, know. we had to do. You know, when uh, when we uh, when we left the BDO, um, to, to make some type of... Uh, rankings up, uh, we had to go to America and Canada quite regular because they, their uh, laws and their constitution wouldn't allow what the BDO had done to us. So we was allowed to play in, in Canada and America and we got the, the ranking system for it, for it from travelling there, really. What was, I mean, what sort of impact or role did Phil have in your Dart's career because you two were very much the you were kind of the leading lights for. Oh well, yeah, we we I mean we, we very rarely when we played because when let me just explain when we when we went to America and Canada it wasn't just going and playing a, a, a one tournament five or one mm. it was it was doubles doubles cricket oh, doubles, doubles five or one yeah, yeah. Uh, mixed pairs triples. You know, you'd, you'd play, I don't know how many tournaments from... Fr we'd get there on Friday afternoon, jet lag, but we'd, we'd be playing Friday night. And it was, it was and like then, a festival of darts, isn't it? It's just tournament after tournament yeah, after tournament. Yeah, they, they had, a, they had a, a good tour. The, the, um, I think it was sponsored by a cigarette company, Lucky Sevens or Lucky Lights or something like that. Mm. And it, it was, you know, it used to be... Uh, New New Orleans in end of April, Dallas in early May. There was there was a there was a like a little type of league going on all the time for Americans, and we we like jumped in. Probably didn't like us because coming to well, take it money. Well, that was it. It was, it was raids from the best players in the world. Over yeah. go over the Atlantic, play these tournaments, win loads of them, yeah. bag as much money as you can, and then scarper out there. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. I mean, I think the only one what was ranked by the BDO was the the Las Vegas Classic. Um, that that was the only one what we really travelled over for. What was I mean, the split between well the BDO and what was the WDC that became the PDC? That was a very difficult time for a lot of people, and particularly the the players that broke away, of which you were one. What brought you to that decision? Was it a hard decision to make? Was it a difficult time for you? Well, it was a very difficult time for all the players that stuck it out. Um, ever so difficult. Uh, we were threatened with losing his house and, and that, you know, we were talking about signing it, signing house over to, to somebody else in the family so they couldn't take it off us. And I suppose that's what broke uh, Mike Gregory. 
uh, them sort of threats. We had loads of loads of threats. They were terrible. And the reason uh, reason we uh, decided to split and we was unanimous, the, the top players, is because um, we'd lost all TV, really. Uh, if, if you look back in the uh, BDO diaries, nearly all the tournaments stopped in 88. Mm. You, got, you, you, know, you got the 88 results and then you, they'd lost probably 10 tournaments and we were only playing in Embassy and, and Windmill. I mean, you, we've said that, you know, that the darts boom was happening and you weren't quite at the stage to take advantage of it. Then you do get there and you're one of the real main men, if not the star draw for it, yeah. and things start falling away. Yeah. And so this was about you trying to make the most of what, all this investment you put in yourself, you the time and the effort and the, the yeah. skill. Yeah, uh, obviously when we broke away, I was, I was number, number one in the world. Uh, so, I mean, but I, I, wasn't, I wasn't a name like uh, Eric and Jockey and John. And, uh, but obviously I, I, I tried to think in my own mind, I wanted to cement myself over a period of a decade. Because I said, it, said to my mate after I won embassy, if I can get, if I can get 10 years out of being, being in, the, in the game, I'd be happy. And it went on to be 20 plus. So, but I got to an age where there wasn't much else I could do. I might as well stick in, stick it, stick in at darts and try and, you know, turn a, a steady living over when I was 60 year old plus. Well, it's better than running a news agent, Dennis. Definitely. <laughs> I got, I think, out of six months, I was up a couple of times to, to see to paper boys. And that was a pain in backside. One had, one had not turned up. So then you've got to start taking that round out yourself. Oh, there's, oh, it was horrendous, man. Dennis, we were talking about the, the split and your sort of rivalry or partnership with Phil Taylor. How would you describe your relationship with Phil Taylor? Uh, it was a working relationship. Uh, we, we tried to uh, do the best we could to, uh, to, to earn as much as we could while things got... Uh, off the ground with the with the PDC putting you know extra putting more tournaments on. Were there doubts like at that time? Did you you know did it feel like a gamble that all you know the fourteen players who had broken away? Did it feel like they, this could fall apart at any minute and oh, it yeah. might go wrong? It was a big gamble, very big gamble. Uh, we uh, we trusted the, the the people what was um, <coughs> advising us. Uh, Tommy Cox and Dick Alex, who, who managed players, uh, they'd been talking with manufacturers. They could see the decline in, they were first to see the decline in, in sales, etc. So they knew uh, something was wrong with the game. So, you know, they, there was some back to, some backers and some, some kept in the background, uh, darts companies. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, it, it was just a, a massive, a massive gamble, which which fortunately paid off. I, I mean, there were. There's a, a great story I've been told by Dick Alex, um, who said that things were so it was so tight for some while that the the company that provided all the the sort of stage set and everything for the World Championship, yeah, they were being called into receivership like two nights before the World Championship. Oh, many a time we had that problem where <laughs> we, we'd, we didn't, we'd won us prize money with, with the World Arts Council, but we, we didn't get, you didn't know, get we paid. didn't get, get paid. Uh, me and Phil, uh, we, lent, we lent them nearly all our prize money. That's why we ended up with more shares than some other players. Turned out it was quite a good deal, wasn't it, Dennis? Well, it was. <laughs> yeah, I just, just wish I'd have uh, kept most of them. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, it was, obviously, the partnership what me and Phil had worked a treat because, um, well, you have two chances instead of one, you know, and we'd, we'd, we'd finish on a Friday night and we used to get paid cash in, in America. We'd throw it on bed, count up, say how much we'd got and, and shared it. And then Saturday we'd do the same. You know, you, you were a big gamble going going over to America and Canada. If you if you probably did if you didn't make semi finals, you'd you'd lost money. Mm. It'd cost you money with with uh, hotel, um, airplane fees, um, 
So it, it was a big gamble. Did Phil, being the relentless winning machine that he became, did that spur you on as a player? No. Um, I always, uh, I've always took the blame for making him the darts monster he, uh, he became. I mean, obviously beating him so comfortable in the 94 final, <laughs> uh, he put him in a situation and fair deals to him. He, he practised harder than, you know, what the rest of them did. And I, I, I always look back and I always think, I wish we'd have been the same age as well. You know, I was giving, giving him 10 years and my, my desire was starting to wane uh, as I got older and got a little bit more comfortable. Well, the, the PDC, beating Phil and taking the PDC World Championship, so you're now a, a world champion in both codes. Did that feel like you'd I'd just completed everything I'd set out to do in this game? Well, it would have done if the, if the, if the cash had been big enough, and, you know, <laughs> if the checks had been big enough, but it, well, you know, it wasn't like that. You, you just got to keep going and hoping you win, win more than you lose. So, I mean, it, would you... What is it the thing that's driven you in your career? Would, is it... Is it Glory, or is it money, or is it both? But, well, a bit of both. Yeah, yeah I've got to say. Bit more money. Well, they all, it always helps. <laughs> got, okay. You know, um, you can have a, a plate full instead of half full. Then. Yes. Well, that's it's interesting. I mean, I, I, Steve Beaton was telling me a story about you, Dennis. I think it might have been when you bought your house, and the bank had said, "Oh, well, there's a fee to transfer the money from your bank account to." where it needs to be, uh, and you weren't having that. So you just I didn't trust took it, it no. yeah, So you just took it out in massive... Yeah. How, how much money did you have to take out of the bank in how many instalments to oh. carry it physically to where it needed to be? It were, it were well, well into multiple thousands. <laughs> uh, I had one, we had one situation, me and wife, um, there was some money in Santander Bank, because I, I think that... They'd bought somebody out and we ended up with Santander. And they were counting all these thousands of pounds out. We had taken us in a, in a room on side and, I'm, and we've got this bag with all money in. I'm walking through the streets of Doncaster, thinking I'm looking around and <laughs> checking everybody. Yeah, it's, it, it is a true story. I didn't uh, really trust uh, <laughs> money, <laughs> money flying through air like that. Well, look, I mean, it has evidently played a part in you doing what you've done and achieving what you've achieved in the game. But you have, was there a part of you, having won the two world titles, yes, you're still playing to win money, but did you want to sort of establish a legacy? There was a period there where you say, I am the best player in the world. If not the best, I'm very, very close for a long, long while. And you've achieved sort of iconic status in the game. I mean, was there ever a thing saying, I do want to... I want to be viewed in that way by... Not Dots particularly out. then, but after. I, yeah. thought I, sh I thought I should have done more. Really? Yeah. I was, I'm, I was... I mean, Phil didn't take over from me until probably 96, mm. r looking roughly at it. And if ever I was, I was going to win a, a second embassy, it, sh it should have been um, the uh, 93 one. Because I'd won, I'd, I'd won virtually everything in uh, the year of 92... I think I won 12, 12 titles out of 17 or, or whatever and semis and f lost in a, f a few finals. So my form were actually fantastic, all of that 92, and yet I came to January, early January 93, and I don't know whether it was Steve Beaton or Alan Warren or what beat, what beat me, actually. Mm. Uh, and it, well, that were a disappointment. I, I, should have actually, I should have actually won 93 one. Probably if I'd have got by that 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 that, that hurdle, what I got beat, um, I would have would have settled and uh, and definitely have won ninety threes. I mean, because it would have, it would have upset it would have an upsetting tournament. That's when all the all the um, I was just going to say all the shit at the fan, but I'll say <laughs> all the dirt at the fan, and everybody <laughs> was upset. And there was a, a final where John Law and uh, Alan Warren had played each other. Mm -hmm. Now Alan Warren had played. I think it was Alan who actually beat me, actually, now looking back at it. And Alan Warriner had played miles better in the four games leading up to the final than, than what John had. 
and uh, he never he never hit the ground running at all in the final. Whether it, the big time got to him on a yeah, Alan will be able to tell you that whether nerves affected him that bad. And it was a poor, poor uh, final average wise as well. So uh, you know, looking back, that's that's when I, I should have won. And one that got away. One. Yeah, that's the one that got away. But having done what you've done, you become a double world champion, and you're still your mainstay in what's becoming the professional dance corporation. I mean, this gamble is is now paid off, but your position in the game is no longer at the very, very top. Obviously, Phil's doing ridiculous things. You have helped create this monster. What was it like? You'd already spoken about it, like your your desire, that sort of fire in the belly, the hunger was starting to wane already. Yeah. Like, what what was it like going through that period? Well, it was it was tough. Um, if you know, I, I've always said, if the money had been in the game, I probably would have only done the ten year. Like, I, I, I mm. you know, I think the last final I played in was uh, two thousand, um, and I was I was past my best then. To be fair. We con a big part of my game was uh, concentration and uh, and not letting all the background noise or anything affect. Uh, I, I could just block it out. How know, did you do that? Did you learn to do that? Yeah, we had to. Yeah, those early players when we broke away, we had to learn that one. Whereas now they they come in knowing what uh, the noise is going to be like and uh, they're used to it. We we had to learn that one. How are we so good at it? Because I mean, you you obviously a very methodical player, Dennis. But you could you could almost see your eyes burning a hole through the board when you're playing, yeah. and it, that is a very difficult thing to do for long, long periods in yeah. big, long multi-set games, isn't it? Because it's tiring, it's mentally yeah. exhausting. That's why I've I've said many times I'd have loved to be able to play the, the same method as uh, Michael Smith and Van Gerwen and Young Luke on now. You know, they they just bump, bump, bump. They've not got their hand up, seeing it shaking all over the place before, <laughs> before the letter dart go. <laughs> but uh, it's super to watch them. And I, I mean, obviously, I wished I'd have been able to play that way, but I, I had to play the way what I got results. And that it, was, it was concentration and uh, determination. Well, we're going to talk about your, your take on the modern game, because I know you're still a fan. We've seen you at tournaments watching it. But um, I do want to talk about your determination because obviously your health was an issue uh, yes. towards the back end of your PDC career. Yes. Um, just talk us through how that, the, the cancer diagnosis, what it was like going through that because, you know, you're still working, you're still a professional player and then yeah, all of a sudden it's it, it came It came to light in 2007 where I, I was um, having broken sleep, uh, getting up to go to the toilet three or four times and I thought this is not uh, this is not something's not right so that was um, mid early uh, 2007 and it was in the October when they finally diagnosed that I'd got prostate cancer um, they took bio they took a biopsy off well my PSA level which is a blood test mm -hmm. that showed that it was there was something there then they uh, did a biopsy and the, the snip um, five pieces off both sides of your prostate, and on one side, the three out of five were cancerous, and the other side was wasn't. So, by by me going and getting uh, advice and being tested, it probably saved my life. Because if I'd have left it and s kept ignoring it, them three, what was cancerous on one side, could have led to five being cancerous on that side, and then going on to the other side and. And then it gets too far where you can't have it removed, or, or you're gonna, or it's it's already spread somewhere else in your body. I mean, I don't, you know, no matter what age you are or what your circumstances, it doesn't matter whether you're a world champion or a coal merchant or just some random person on the street. Any kind of cancer diagnosis has got to be a scary thing. What was that like going? Through? Well. I mean, obviously, I mean, it would be a blow. And I was, I was, they actually rung me up. We was uh, on holiday in, in Cyprus because uh, we used to like to go in October. It was very nice, uh, nice weather. And um, she said over the phone, I've got some news for you. I um, think you best sit down. And then she said, uh, you've got, you know, you've got prostate cancer. And that was a bit of a shock. But uh, I always took it, you know, I always took it on the chin and I thought, well, what's what's meant to be is meant to be. It's no use 
you know, being over over worried or or showing it to the upsetting your family type of thing, you know. They if they saw you being being upset, they'd be upset. It's quite a stoic Yorkshire so, attitude to you it. You know, you just um, I had I had one one more after it all. I probably recall one moment where where I was at a, a low ebb. To come through that though, and it is a, it was a long process, and a, that's it. It's not just a diagnosis, and well, now you can start getting. It. There's, there's a whole process that you have to go through, and you, it's all in doubt. Yeah. What was it like coming through that and realizing that you still had so much more stuff to look forward to and do? Well, that's it, isn't it? I mean, um, I had a, a granddaughter, uh, weren't, weren't very old at that particular time. You want to see them grow up. Um, I, like I said, I got diagnosed in the October, and I looked at the and the surgeons, the, the people what were looking after me, uh, uh, Doctor Ferguson, a lady doctor, and uh, Mr. John Levekis. Look, look, take your time. There's no, no immediate panic or rush, and so you've got three alternatives. You can wait and see. I didn't think much to that. To what that one? Wait and see what happens. You could have uh, radiotherapy and have it that way, or you could have it to surgically removed. So, and they wouldn't advise you which one were best. You've got to make your own decision. So I decided the best. But I, I thought cancer. I wanted it out of my body. That's that one made me the thought. But first of all, I said to him, "Well, I'll have radiotherapy first. If that don't work, then you can take it out." Oh no, it don't work like that because it shrivels everything up. Mm. Um, the radiotherapy. So um, I looked at the situation and I thought, well, there's a window to probably be operated on in after World Championships in in the January, and uh, whether it whether it were meant to be, uh, I lost. I don't know, first game or second game, and I had the operation on the th- I think it was the third of January, 2008, and uh, I had it. I had it I'd done privately because I wanted it to. <coughs> excuse me. I wanted it to fit in uh, with, with my schedule, so I had it done private with a with a guy at uh, up, up at Sunderland, Mr. Damien Green, operated on me. I mean, you're still playing darts at this point. You're still qualifying for World Championships. You're you're still you know on the circuit. I mean, that's an incredibly difficult thing to do while all that's going on, isn't it? Well, yeah, but uh, like I said, I, I, I took it uh, in, the, in the the way that if 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 it's going to kill me, it's going to kill me. There's no I can do about it. No use worrying about it. You know what? What like I said, what we're meant to be would would be, um, and that's the only advice I can get to get to people. Uh, you've got to you've got to see out see what happens and get the best advice and. And hopefully it's not gone too far. The art of beating any cancer is is getting early diagnosis, and it don't matter what which which part of your body you've got it, because there's 247 different cancers. Last seminar I went to two or three years ago, because I'm a, a patient to Western Park uh, Sheffield Cancer, and I, I used to go to seminars and listen to professors talking, and I think it, I think the two hardest were to de- detect. Because it had got all the all the of 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 the uh, parts part of body where it was to lay it was uh, pancreatic and uh, I think the other was lung. They they've got really set in before you see any symptoms, mm. and it's it's like I said they're all curable if you get in if you get treated early enough. Well, good advice, and I know you've done you've done work. I think you may be doing prostate, more work. yeah, a lot prostate, of prostate, prostate cancer work and etc. Um. You, what was it like the end of your career? I mean, I know that you know, having been at such heights um, and, you know, battled through, you know, cancer diagnosis and treatments and everything else and kept on going, but ultimately time does catch up with everybody, even the greats. Yeah. What was it like you deciding to call quits on it? I mean, to be honest, Eddie, I'll, I, well, I I'll tell you, I'll, I'll answer that, Dan, and, and it'll save you probably uh, uh, going on to another question. Um, when it was uh, COVID and there was lockdown, mm. I'd work in and uh, and I lost. I'd probably get a motion over here. Um, the kid who 
a friend, best mate, um, he died early in, in the prostrate uh, thing. I um, think they took him in hospital on April the 3rd. He had his 69th birthday on the 11th and died on the 18th. So I agreed to do all the exhibitions. What came back to me were, were booked in during the uh, epidemic. Mm -hmm. And um, it just wasn't the same. So I just called it a day. That was so it. that would be two years next week. I did my last exhibition. I mean, I understand how this is the, the sort of enjoyment of it is gone. Do you look back and miss the game, or do you...? No, um, th th that's a big question what's asked quite regular. Um, no, I, I've, I have, I've had my moments and uh, enjoyed everything. Um, no, I, 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 don't, I didn't, didn't miss it at all. Um, like I said, if, if the money had been in the game and uh, up around about 20, 20 uh, year 2000, I'd have probably packed in then. I mean, to be fair, Dennis, it's not that long ago that I remember you saying I prefer a game of cards to a game of darts nowadays. Anyway. Oh, yeah, I love a game of, a game of crib <laughs> or a game of crash. You know, but, um, yeah, the, that was the big, uh, the big turning point. Um, and there was one, we, I think we were playing at Wigan, and it was a two-day event. And I, I went on the Saturday, I think I got beat by a youngster or somebody what? I, I probably thrown back as I could have beat him at one time. And, and, I, and next morning I got up to come again to, to Wigan one. I says, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not going. Done. And I'd paid 100 quid and a Yorkshireman paying 100, and, I think it was 110 quid actually because they just started with paying pay, uh, chokers. Paying markers, yeah. So that was, you know, to to like not go when you paid 100 quid as, for a Yorkshireman, it was... It was really saying something. So, and why I said, right, if you've had enough, that's it. You still like the game, though, don't you? You still follow it. I mean, you've already mentioned, like, so, look, there are, there are players I will not mention, Dennis, who, if you ask them about the modern game and who they think's good at the minute, they can't really give you an answer because they've not really been paying attention. But you've already mentioned you know, Michael Smith and Luke Humphreys. Luke Humphreys just won his, his first major title, as we see yeah. here in tour. I mean, yeah. are they. You still enjoy watching. We've seen you go to Ali Pali and watch. We, you were down here in Barnsley Metrodome the other week, yeah, yeah. watching a bit of yeah. it. I mean, you still get enjoyment from watching the game. I do. I, I, I like to see uh, the youngsters coming through, and I actually tip Luke to win that one at um, eight to one. Uh, me and me and uh, my son Michael and my, uh, my daughter's partner Richard, we went, uh, and I said, "Look, I says uh, he's eight to one, uh, Luke Humphreys." Shorter odds than Priestley winning the embassy. I'd, uh, I'd, I'd have a tenner on him or 20 quid, and th th they did, and I'd, I didn't even have a bet. <laughs> um, what is it about the, the sport that keeps you hooked? Like, are you remembering your old glories, or are you just appreciating well, yeah, it the, for what it is? There's, there's, a, there's a few pass, pass through your head, uh, the memories, what... Why, you know, the ones what you've lost. Uh, I mean, I should never have lost the first uh, match play at Blackpool. I think uh, we went in a break and I was 7-2 up or something like that. And Larry Butler said to, uh, said to me, will you have a word with, with uh, MC? Try and get some order. I mean, it was it was a rowdy crowd, but like I said, I, I, I'd, I'd learnt how to switch off. And from that point on, I heard nothing... I heard the crowd all the time. <laughs> nothing, nothing but the crowd. And I ended up getting beat. And I thought, well, that's either a smart move on Larry Butler's uh, part to, to, to break my concentration or, it, it, you know, it was my silly fault. Were there any, do you have, ever encounter any dark arts from opposition players? Oh, the, players? I used to love it when they used to, they used to take their good at board and screw each dart out separate, you know, separately. And yeah. then... Halfway back, they turn around and have a look at scoreboard, and I thought, I've got you beat already here. <laughs> they try, you know, they try any, anything. Anything, like, because that's the thing, your, your great strength is your concentration. To try and distract you just yeah. didn't didn't work. It didn't uh, early day, early doors. Um, that's where I think I went downhill. 
the fastest on the mental side, not so much the uh, the throwing side. Mm. Just yeah. being able to maintain yeah, to that. maintain it instead of gi- giving them chances and making it harder for yourself. You know, when you when you keep letting them in and and instead of going on and uh, punishing them and and winning easy. With the, I mean, look, you've been involved in all the big tournaments and everything, and, and you've played at Ali Pali and you played Premier League and everything. But when you see where the game of darts is now, are there things like that you look at and think, I wish they'd had that in my day? Not just the winners' checks, but in terms of the crowds or how this game has grown around the world, they're there. It's changed so much since you've been involved and since you've retired, but. Are you, do you like the way that darts has gone? Well, I mean, obviously the the Premier Leagues is is out to finance what big prize money they get they're getting, and uh, I mean, obviously, um, if I was being involved, I'd, I'd I'd probably try and calm that down a bit more because I was only talking with somebody today, and they said there were, you know, the the be fights breaking out. I mean, to have a Premier League in Sheffield. And and it's a two city. It's it's a two football city. You mm, know what I mean. Yeah. And Manchester's same. Having them there, the 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 clashing. You know. And I mean, ninety percent go for crack to enjoy the self, which which they should do. And um, but ten percent would love to. You know, watch watch the darts without all the noise. It's but it's a festive it's a festive job for them. You know, dressed up all. All in different gear and that, and they, they go and, they, and I must admit the atmosphere is still a buzz. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's the thing, isn't it? The the big money and the interest and the global broadcasting deals, all that stuff that's making modern players really rich, mm. comes to the fact that people are going for a, a night out, and a lot of yeah. them won't be hardcore darts fans. No. I mean, is that that's a sacrifice that the sports had to make, but it has led to vast wealth for the players. Which would you prefer to? Do you, would you prefer to play yeah, back you've in got, the day? You've got to go with the vast wealth. I mean, it, it's, it's a short period you, you, you're at the top. I mean, prior to to to, uh, to Phil Taylor, there's not many have got a, a decade out of out of the sport being dominant. You know, you'd, in snooker you've got Steve Davis and Stephen Henry. They only they only d- d- dominated for a decade. Um, and and in darts there was there was same Eric only dominated for the eighties and but Phil Taylor dominated for two decades which which is a, you know such a remarkable achievement to be fair. How satisfying uh, is it though, Dennis, to have been you know straddled the era of Bristow and Taylor and be a world champion in both codes and you can say that there's undeniably the most successful player in history and a. Well, a lot of people put the top three ever. Mm. You know, I was there, beat them both. I won world titles. I mean, that must be such a satisfying feeling. Well, of course it is. I mean, we we all have egos. It don't matter how how laid back and placid you are. We, we've got us we've got us egos. And we were, I was only speaking with someone uh, the other day that um, during when during when I won the embassy, I, I set certain records. The, the highest average in a set to the most 180s. I set records to, the, you know, what what are getting beat. But I think the only, only record I still hold is um, I'm still the, old, the oldest player to win a tour, tour um, tournament in Australia, Masters. And I was 60 years old. I don't think anybody's gone into the sixes and won a tournament. Which, they, they're getting which younger, is, if anything, Dennis. Yeah, uh, which is a, a record, you know, I'd like to keep. Excellent, Dennis Priestley, uh, an icon of the sport. Yeah. It's been an honour. Can to we speak to you. just mention the uh, the players? What? Yes, of course. They, they never get mentioned. I mean, obviously, there's myself, Phil Taylor, John Law, Bob Anderson, Cliff Lazarenko, Jamie Harvey, Keith Deller, Alan Warriner, Rod Arrington, Richie Gardner, Peter Everson, Kevin Spielek, and and and, t- and the two guys. Well, sadly, are not with us anymore. Jockey Wilson and Eric Bristow, and the two guys. What? Uh, what what didn't stick it out, Mike Gregory? Um, obviously, Mike's dead, and I always wondered what uh, what happened to Chrissy Johns. Whether they they did regret it, you know, uh, going back. Uh, I suppose the surprise one was Chrissy Johns. He'd he'd probably got uh, no commitments at that time, 
a Welsh lad normally they don't scab as we call it in the with the miners' disputes when when they was happening there, and uh, that. But I couldn't understand with with Mike. Um, he, he was he was got got at by uh, different people, saying they were going to lose his house, etc. and etc. And he did he did uh, actually do it for them them reasons. To be, I mean, it, we said before, like it was a difficult time and a, a very dangerous position for everyone to be in, but. The gamble that you guys took paid off royally. It's paid, yeah, it's paid off. And I, I just hope that the, the youngsters and the people what's earning the big money now appreciate what um, what we did in, in uh, 1993 to create the, the PDC. That's why we do these things. Dennis, Thank pleasure you. to speak to you. Cheers, Thank Dan. Thank you very much. Thank you.